Okay, so one of the other things that we have to discuss besides the media is how we process specimens in the clinical microbiology lab. So one of the most important things that you can learn is what should I be looking for in each of my sites? So it says, know the most common pathogens for the site. So where did the specimen come from? What are the things that I should be looking for? So in eyes, I'm just making sure that I didn't skip something. I didn't. Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, eyes that get infected um, tend to grow a few different things or could be the infection could be caused by a couple different things. One of the things that we look for in eye infections is staph. Sometimes it's staph epidermis that somebody has gotten a scratch or a cut and then just some of the normal flora got in there and causes weirdness happen to happen. Um, or one of the other ones, the Staph aureus. Staph aureus infections in the eye are very purulent, very pussy. Um, they get kind of weird looking too. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae is a common eye pathogen, as well as Haemophilus influenza, Moraxella catarralis. Um, and Neisseria. Okay, Neisseria gonorrhea can get an eye. Um, typically, this is an accident, uh, accidental exposure, but it happens. And then uh, Chlamydia trachomatis can cause a lot of eye infections, and it causes blindness in many communities in um, some of our the other countries of the world. And you'll learn about that, more about that this semester. So, eye infections, um, since we're looking for gram positives and we're looking for gram negatives, we're going to want something that will grow both. Um, there are, McConkies are typically for enteric gram negative organisms, so that is not usually something that we use. Okay, um, notice that I have a question mark there. That would be in a, an odd situation. They may ask for McConkie. Um, so if there's green discharge coming from the eye, then yes, I would put a McConkie on it because maybe it's pseudomonas infection. Okay. Um, the blood auger plate, once you swab the the plate and then streak for isolation, you're going to want to add uh, an optichin disc. Um, the optichin disc has typically has a P on it if it's a taxo disc. Um, and the P is for pneumonia, so streptococcus pneumonia. You'll put it on chocolate, okay, and you'll then you'll put the swab into a backup broth. So tryptocase soy broth, so that if there is, it's relatively low in numbers, it will grow better in the broth, and then we can sub the broth the next day, and then we can put it out as we found this pathogen in thio only. So it tells them it's not a lot, but yeah, there was an infection starting. So <clears throat> the blood auger will help to see the difference between the beta hemolysis of staph aureus um, or the not homo hemolytic staph epidermis or the alpha hemolysis of the strep pneumoniae. So blood auger is very useful. Chocolate will has the required nutrients needed for the recovery of both Haemophilus influenza and Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay. Um, Moraxella catarralis will grow on both blood and chocolate. So that is not a problem. It'll grow on both. And what we have to worry about is whether or not 
we have that chlamydia in there because that is um, very special types of culturing methods that you would need. You would actually need to collect a different specimen and that would be a send out because we would have to do um, molecular testing for that. So typically the eye is rinsed regularly with your tears. Um, and tears typically contain lysozyme, so that it'll, it will kill or degrade any bacteria that are there. But if you, for some reason, get a scratch or something, um, and the, the bacteria get in there and they grow, multiply like crazy and cause an infection, then, then you can have an issue. Okay. So, next, ear infections. Okay. Oh, wait. Remember, I told you guys this before, and I'll keep telling you this. Blood auger, if there is blood auger in the setup, you will quantitate from the blood auger. So you'll be few, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus from the blood auger. Unless it's a urine, and then you have to give actual colony counts. Okay, so again, blood auger, chocolate auger, but in this case, we're definitely going to incorporate the MAC into this, McConkie, because Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the number one causative agent of swimmer's ear. So um, a lot of people see green discharge coming from their ears when they get an ear infection, and it's usually because they've been swimming and couldn't get uh, the water out or they took a shower and couldn't get all the water out okay again we're looking for staphs we're looking for strep pneumonia we're looking for haemophilus influenza okay all of these can cause problems in the upper respiratory tract again ear infections you don't typically see a lot of organisms in the ear so the ear infection you're going to have a backup broth um, if it's an aspirate specimen, so if it's actually not a drainage that's coming out of the ear, but if they had to pop through the eardrum to get into the, the middle ear, then you're going to use a backup broth. Again, we are going to keep these things for 48 hours. We're going to look at them on the first day of reading. We're going to look at them on the second day of reading. If we don't see any growth on or any pathogens on the second day, we're going to put it out as no pathogens isolated. Same thing with those eyes. Okay. Throat infections. Um, there are two different types of cultures that we can do for throats. You can do an actual throat culture or you can do a strep culture. And strep cultures, the old way that we used to do it is we would use a blood auger plate and we would add a bacitracid disc. Okay, that's one way to do it. Um, what we're looking for is strep group A, which is Streptococcus pyogenes. The A disc is bacitracin. It's 0 0.04 um, units on that disc. So now there is strep selective auger that selects for a strep group A. So it's actually kind of a better thing to use nowadays. Um, but again, that is just for a strep culture. If you're looking for an honest to God throat culture, okay, and look at this bacitracin disc, you see it'll not grow. This beta hemolytic organism will not grow around the bacitracin disc. So there's a zone of inhibition around the A disc. So, honest to God, throat infections, we're going to put it on blood and we're going to put it on chocolate. Okay. The blood, we'll be able to see if there's any hemolysis. The chocolate is going to grow everything from Neisseria haemophilus, anything. It'll grow all the enterics, any, anything that could possibly be found. You may have yeast infections because the person may have thrush. Um... Carinobacterium diphtheriae 
it will grow on these media but you know there's a better media for that if you have diphtheria in the United States you have not kept up with your vaccination so that's all I got to say about that um, but Staph aureus is, is common, Candida albicans is common, Streptopyogenes is common. Um, sometimes there are other streps that you get. So you can end up um, with strep group C. Strep group C last year caused a horrendous sore throat in many, 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 many individuals. Um, I was one of them. Mrs. Colin Shane was another one. Um, both of us ended up with this terrible, terrible strep group C. Um, it was just going around and it was not a strep throat haha ha. um, because it wasn't group A strep but yeah a little bit of antibiotics would have been really nice but your body will kick it out and your body typically will kick out strep group A as well it's just a matter of time um, so the people who end up with the antibiotics are kids mostly and people who have very low tolerance to pain um, <laughs> because <laughs> they 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 won't give adults antibiotics unless you are in extreme pain so <clears throat> so homophilus could be homophilus influenza could be homophilus para influenza um, Parainfluenza is one of the ones that causes hoarseness in throat infections. So people will end up getting very hoarse if they have a homophilus parainfluenza infection. Uh, Neisseria meningitidis causes Neisseria meningitis. So if we see this in a throat, we need to have that, like, we need to check it out, find out. If it definitely is Neisseria meningitis, like go act on it very quickly. Get the the physicians aware. Become make them very very aware very very quickly, because um, you do not want anybody to get meningitis because you failed to uh, alert the physician. Okay, deep respiratory specimens such as sputums. Okay, uh, they get blood. And we're going to put a P disc on here because deep respiratory tends to be that something went down deep. Streptococcus pneumoniae is one of the more common organisms that causes pneumonia. Okay, it's called pneumonia for a reason because it causes pneumonia. Um, chocolate auger, again, because of the Haemophilus and or Neisseria, typically the Neisseria don't go down that deep. Okay, just saying. Um, Haemophilus can, Haemophilus influenza can cause uh, pneumonia, and the McConkies for any type of gram-negative rod. Some of the more common gram-negative rods that we see in deep specimens are Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, that comes a lot of times for people who um, are irrigating or have been on a ventilator and also Klebsiella pneumoniae is very common or Klebsiella mostly pneumonia oxytoca but um, mostly pneumonia okay so if you see pneumonia as the second name or species name there's a really good chance that it causes pneumonia or that they've found it to be related to pneumonia Okay. Um, sputum specimens, they are incubated for 48 hours as well. You're going to quantitate off of the blood plate. Um, what we have to do with these, though, is we have to actually look to see if the sputum is a good specimen before we plate it. So we screen sputums for acceptability. And depending on your institution, you're going to look for less than 10 epithelials per low power field, or you're going to look for less than 10 epithelials and greater and or greater than 25 white cells per low power field. It just depends on the institution where you work. Okay. 
So less than 10 epis is usually a good indication. Um, if you see more than 25 whites and you have 15 epis per your low power field, that's going to be a, a tough call because you have a whole lot of white cells in there, so that's probably going to indicate an infection. So really you have to, you know, the, the institution where you work is going to set the guidelines on what you're going to do. And always, always, always err on the side of the patient. Um, if someone is very sick and they need help. Okay. Now these are only expectorated sputums. Okay. That get screened. Um, tracheal aspirates and, and things of that nature. They, they do not. If it's an induced sputum, you do not. Okay. Because they have put that person through holy Hannah to try to get a sputum. So you are going to plate that sucker anyway. So it is just an expectorated sputum, not induced. They better tell you that it's induced if they induced it. Um, but only a random expectorated sputum gets screened. Okay. So sputum can, can, sorry, pneumonia or lower respiratory tract infections can be caused by beta hemolytic strep, strep group A, strep group B, C, F, and Gs. Um, it can be caused by Staph aureus. That's pretty common. Um, Candida albicans. You don't. Yeast typically don't thrive um, down deep. They do grow in smaller numbers typically, um, but a lot of times you you can see them as overgrowing an area, especially if they've had massive amounts of um, broad spectrum antibiotics, which will kill gram positives and gram negatives. Strep pneumo, you're looking for the alpha hemolysis. Okay. Um, Haemophilus influenza, you're going to look and it's going to grow on chocolate, but not on blood. Okay. Neisseria will grow on chocolate, not on blood. For gonorrhea, Neisseria meningitidis will grow on both. Okay. And remember, your gram-negative rods are typically mucoid. Okay. Um, stools. This is kind of interesting because stool cultures are becoming a way of the past. So you always put it on McConkie, and you always either put it on HEA or XLD so that you could see if there was uh, hydrogen sulfide production. You always kept the stools for at least 24 or at least 48 hours. Um, and you would either use an SS broth or a GN broth so that you could enrich the recovery of Salmonella and Shigella. Okay. <clears throat> um, your pathogens, your most common pathogens, Salmonella and Shigella. Another one that's pretty common, the E. coli, but it's not your regular E. coli. It's 0157H7. Um, that's the bad guy who can kill you. Now, remember we talked about E. coli 0157H7 with the McConkie with sorbitol plates. Okay, E. coli 0157H7 is pink on McConkie, colorless on McConkie with sorbitol. Remember? Doesn't, doesn't do the sorbitol fermentation. Um, Vibrio, Yersinia, and Campylobacter jejuni all require special plates. So the Vibrio will grow on the TCBS plates. The Yersinia will be on the CIN plates. And Campylobacter jejuni are on Campylobacter plates. They also require a microaerophilic environment. Okay. And 42 degrees Celsius incubation for campy. All right, urines. So urines get plated on blood and on McConkie. And you're going to plate it using the 1,000th or of a milliliter or one microliter loop. Okay. And <clears throat> you're going to plate it on blood first and then on the McConkie. And 
if you have any species that has more than a hundred colonies growing on these plates, then you can say that the person has a urinary tract infection. The protocol or the guidelines or cutoff for a urinary tract infection is greater than a hundred thousand colony forming units per milliliter. Okay, so you're plating one one thousandth of a milliliter. So for every colony that forms, that would be a thousand cells in a milliliter. Okay, so anytime you get a hundred or more, it's well greater than a hundred. It's greater than a hundred thousand colony forming units per milliliter. You always, always, always quantify from the blood auger. Um, the most common pathogen that we find in urines is E. coli. Okay. There are other gram-negative rods that will also cause infections like Proteus and Cleb and Pseudomonas. Um, we see a lot of Candida albicans, which are yeasts. Um, sometimes we'll see Staph aureus or even Strep group B, Streptococcus agalactiae. Um, urines get red once. We read them at 24 hours, and that is it. Okay, so we finalize urines at 24 hours. Um... Depending on what kind of urine comes in depends on how you work it up. So a catheterized urine that has less than three organisms, you work up both organisms. If it is a random urine and there are more than three things growing, it's contaminated. Now, if only one of those is grown out to 100,000 and the other ones are just little tiny, you know, a heat, one or two here, you're going to work up the one that's predominating, okay? But that's the kind of stuff that I'm going to teach you next semester when we're reading plates, okay? But most common pathogen of urine, E. coli. All right, genitals. Now, genitals could be a vaginal. It could be a cervical. It could be urethral discharge from a man. Um, it could be any type of a wound, like on the outer labia, um, on the penis or the, the testicles. It could be anywhere in those genital area. You still need to be looking for Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, anything that's genital. Um, that's not, the genitals are not the only place that we deal with the Neisseria gonorrhea. It's not the only place we find Neisseria gonorrhea. We also find them in the rectum and in, in the throat and in the eye. And believe it or not, we found it in the ear. I mean, weird, weird places, um, that these, that it shows up. But, okay, you're going to plate it on blood. That's where we would normally quantitate from, unless it's Neisseria gonorrhea, right? Um, chocolate and Thayer Martin, or a Gembeck plate. The Gembeck plates, um, they directly inoculate them at when they collect from the patient and they, they swab it in a Z manner. And then when we get them into the lab, we streak across the Z. Uh, so that then we can get isolated colonies from their swab. We hold them for 48 hours. We look at them at 24 hours. We look at them at 48 hours. Um, a lot of times Neisseria gonorrhea will not grow in 24 hours. It will only be little teeny tiny little haze and you have to wait for it to grow out the next day. Um, we cannot grow chlamydia trachomatis in our labs. It's that's special culturing. 
uh, that there are some labs that do chlamydia cultures. Most of them just do uh, molecular testing for them now, DNA probes. So gram-negative enterics, all those gram-negative rods, um, there are plenty of those things that end up in the vaginal area. Uh, Staph aureus, normally there in low numbers. If it overgrows, that can be a problem. Streptococcus agalactiae. We're always looking for Streptococcus agalactiae, particularly in pregnant women. Okay, and one of the things that we do is we have Group B strep screens on pregnant women. We put them in limb broth for 24 hours. We pull the limb broth. We sub it to a blood auger to a, to see if we can grow strep agalactiae. Strep agalactiae can be very detrimental to a, a fetus or a newborn. So we need to make sure that we protect them by being able to treat mom um, with antibiotics. Gardnerella vaginalis is normal flora. Uh, if the pH gets all whacked out in the vagina, uh, then Gardnerella vaginalis will overgrow the area by leaps and bounds. Um, and that's when there's that like fishy smell. Um, typically because the pH of the vagina has become too high um, and it's an overgrowth, it's a super infection and we really just need to adjust our pH and get back to normal, but um, we can treat this. Candida albicans, yeast infection, again this is another overgrowth thing, but you know it's a little different than the Gardnerella vaginalis. Wounds. You have to know where the wound came from. If you don't know where the wound came from, you will be guessing and shooting in the dark, and you will not know what it is that you're supposed to be looking for. So, if you get a wound culture and there is no site, call, find out where it came from. You need to know. Okay? So, it could be a wound that's on the outer labia for a woman. You would need to inc incorporate Thayer Martin in there, okay? If it's a deep wound, if it's a stab wound, right, um, or a puncture wound, you need to have anaerobic media in there. There are There's a lot that you have to worry about when it comes to a wound. You need to know what's going on. Now, interestingly enough, they have to order anaerobic cultures now, anaerobic wound cultures. They have to order the anaerobic piece of it. Um, we always have a backup because in the backup broth, if it only grows at the bottom of the broth, then we tend to believe that that would be an anaerobe growing. So then we would take that and we would do an anaerobic challenge and we would grow it on blood and we would grow it on anaerobic media and we would put the anaerobic media in anaerobic conditions and the, and the blood in aerobic conditions and see if it grew in both situations or not. Um, but wounds are typically kept for 48 hours um, and then reported at 48 hours. If you haven't noticed yet, there's a plethora and almost all of these things are 48 hours. So almost all cultures are reported out at 48 hours. Urines get reported out at 24 hours. And then we're going to see CSFs, cerebrospinal fluids. They get reported out at 72. But again, blood and chocolate and McConkie. Those are the big three. You need those to be able to capture your gram negatives, your beta hemolytics, any Neisseria and or Haemophilus. So you need to catch them all. Now, if they want, if they're thinking that it could be Vibrio um, or it could be, um, yeah, if they think that it could be Vibrio, the, there's a increased likelihood that we'll catch it if we have TCBS, um, but some of the Vibrio will actually grow on blood or in chocolate, so that's not terrible. 
It's just, if it's overgrown with everything else, we may have a problem. Um, the wound thing, the most common things that we're looking for, we're looking for staph aureus. That's, that's a huge one. Um, and any beta hemolytic strep, streptococcus pyogenes, strep group A, can cause hugely detrimental um, damage. It can cause you to lose limbs because grep, group A strep can cause necrotizing, necrotizing fasciitis, so it basically eats away your flesh. Um, and you lose limbs that way. But group C strep, group F strep, group G strep, they can all, they're all beta hemolytic streps that can cause infections. Um, and those are typically animal associated streps. Okay. Um, there are gram negative rods that can cause some really terrible, terrible um, diseases and conditions. You want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're aware of what we're dealing with. Um, bacillus anthracis will grow on blood and it'll grow aerobically. Clostridium tetani and Clostridium perfringens are both anaerobes. Um, Clostridium perfringens causes gas gangrene. Tetani causes tetanus. Hmm, not a cool thing. So we just need to see what we can find. All right. Um, a central line or an intravenous IV, if they, if you get something that looks like this, a cath tip is what they do it, they call it a catheter tip, um, this is something that has been threaded into an artery or a vein to allow for the administration of fluids and or medications. So, it is it has come from a sterile site. It was sterile when it was put in. You need to handle it in a sterile manner. Okay. Now, they are handling it with metal forceps, and they would have had to have sterilized those metal forceps before they touched that plastic catheter. Every single time that I would try to do that with metal forceps, I would end up melting the forceps. I wouldn't allow my forceps to, uh, or I'm melting the catheter. I would not allow my forceps to cool long enough, but I was afraid of contamination getting on my forceps. So I learned really fast that swabs come in sterile packages, and if you use the swab ends, the wooden sticks, to roll the the um, catheter on the media, you can also pick it up with them if you know how to use chopsticks and put it into the thiol. Um, and it's already sterile and I didn't have to worry about anything. Um, but that's what you do. You get the cath tip, you put it on the blood auger plate, you roll it around on there, you pick up the catheter tip and you put it in thioglycolate broth. Okay. Um, and then you incubate for 48 hours. And you look at the blood, and you look at the thio, and you look at the blood, and you look at the thio, and you sub the thio the first day to make sure that there really isn't any growth in there. Any growth um, is typically significant. Some places use the cutoff of it has to be more than five colonies. <clears throat> Cerebrospinal fluid, you're going to use blood. Of course, you're going to use chocolate because Neisseria meningitidis and Haemophilus influenza can both cause uh, meningitis. Streptococcus pneumoniae can also cause meningitis. Cerebrospinal fluid is supposed to be sterile, so or, or it is sterile. So guess what? Any growth is significant. You need to find out what it is that's growing on there. Um, Cryptococcus neoformans is a yeast that causes um, meningitis, E. coli, and Listeria monocytogenes, as well as strep group B, are also issues when we're talking about smaller children, okay? So, put it on blood, put it on chocolate, put it on, put it in thioglycolate media.
Now, first thing I'm going to tell you is cerebrospinal fluid, you typically, um, if you want to see a gram stain on it and you want to see anything in this thing, um, you know, you may have to centrifuge it if you want to, if you have to do a gram stain. For this, we hold our cultures for 72 hours. So you look at it the first day, you reincubate, look at it the second day, reincubate just to make sure that we don't have some Neisseria or some crazy slow grower that just didn't want to grow the first day or two. Okay. It's a double, triple, quadruple check just to make sure. And if we think that there might be a, a reason for meningitis to be either yeast or fungal, you're going to add fungal media to the setup. Body fluids, anything in a body fluid. Same thing with the cerebrospinal fluid, anything in the body fluid. One of the more common things that we get in joint fluids, um, Neisseria gonorrhea, weirdness, but true. Um, but there's all different kinds. Of, there's all different kinds of body fluids. So depending on where it came from, is where we need to think of what we need to deal with. So if it's um, pericardial or pleural fluids, um, pericardial, of course, the heart doesn't have any normal flora, but it is in it is really close to the lungs. And pleural fluids, you are going to be looking at all those normal things that we would look at for those deep respiratory cultures. Um, so deep respiratory cultures also go with the pericardial. Again, blood chocolate McCulloch, put it in the backup broth, look at it at 24 hours, sub the th thioglycolate 24 hours, read it again the next day. Hopefully there's no growth in 48 hours. If there is growth, you better start working it up. Okay. Um... If you get a tissue, somebody brings you a toe, somebody brings you a bone, and they want a culture of the bone, um, you need to grind these things up. You need to macerate them. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do sometimes. Um, but we do it. And bones can become particularly difficult to do. Sometimes you can't grind them at all. You can't break them. You can't cut them. They're very, very solid. Um, if it comes down to it, you talk to the pathologist and ask if you have permission to just put it in thioglycolate. <laughs> um, and I've had to do that before. Um, I have taught, and, and you know, I'm like, you, know, you take it back in the macerator and you're like, see, I can't even make a dent. I can't, it's not working. And then they'll be like, okay, fine, that, that works, you know. So put it on blood, put it on chocolate, put it on McConkey, put it in your thioglycolate broth. And if they didn't order an anaerobic culture, you might want to double check and make sure that they didn't want one. Especially if you're grinding up these tissues and, you know, it's something that they've removed from a body. They might be interested in finding out if there's an aerobe in there. Blood cultures um, get collected in blood culture bottles and what you need to know is that you clean the tops of the bottles, you clean the patient's arm from inside to the out in concentric circles. Um, there's special preps that you use for them. It's not just act Iodine, or it's not just alcohol. Um, we used to use alcohol on the skin first and then use iodine. There's a lot of people that are allergic to iodine, so we stopped doing that. Now we're using chlorhexidine preps, I believe. Um, that or BZK preps, either one. And what we do is once they're collected, the media is in the bottle. The bottle goes into a machine that keeps them for five to seven days, depending on your institution. And the machine constantly monitors the CO2 in the bottle, the amount of pressure that's in the bottle, and the pH of the bottle. So if the pH decreases or the CO2 increases, it's going to flag it as positive. And then you have to take 
some of the blood out of that medium and played it out on blood, chocolate, and or McConkie. Um, and if it came out of the anaerobic bottle, you also are going to have to put it on anaerobic media and put the anaerobic media in an anaerobic environment. Okay. Now, blood's supposed to be sterile, right? So pretty much if something grows in blood, that would be the pathogen. Um, we do have some more common pathogens than others. And we also have some common contaminants, but not going there. If it comes up in the blood cultures, uh, if it comes up in both of the bottles, there's a really good chance it's truly a an infection, not just a contaminant. Okay, good. Done.